No, it's always nice to come to Riga, and I do thank you for the nice um, invitation. These are pictures, 20 years, covering from 2003, 2023, both from conferences and from clinical work that uh, we have been pursuing here. So my talk uh, would uh, like to cover some aspects of application of laser spectroscopy in medicine. And uh, I don't pretend to, to uh, cover everything, of course, but I have selected a few things. We have some world uh, challenges which we have to meet. And uh, one of them is the increasing incidence of cancer. We know that there will be a doubling of cancer cases during uh, this time span here. And of course, detection, early detection is the key for the prognosis of the patients. And we have been working a lot with the detection of uh, early cancer, soon a touch upon fluorescence, and we have been using laser-induced fluorescence a lot for that purpose. Also, minimal invasive therapy is a wish. So we don't need to keep the patients too long in the hospitals and still be efficient. Another aspect is infectious diseases. Soon I mentioned a little bit about that, but I will touch upon the antibiotic resistance which really is a threat, equally bad and big as the global warming, I would say. In a few years, there might not be any antibiotics to cure diseases. And of course, COVID-19 has showed explicitly how vulnerable the world is for infectious diseases. To the right here, you see the global cancer incidence covered 2020 uh, among the different continents. So cancer is a man killer in Europe and worldwide. And uh, approximately, as I write here, 30% of the cancer death in the Western world are caused by cancer. Only cardiovascular diseases uh, covers more of death rate. It's also, it's also interesting to see that the incidence is higher in big cities, in large cities, than in the rural area. And that has, of course, different explanations, which the epidemiologists tell us. Here you see a list from uh, some epidemiologists where they have tried to, uh, by percentage, show what the, what, the, what the reasons are for developing cancer. And you see that quite impressive is food. So it's really important how the food is prepared. And that's maybe not the food per se, but that's constituents in the food. You also see, of course, tobacco smoking. I have also a picture here from China with pollution. And there are different things, of course, that causes that we develop cancer tumors. Um, age is a paramount factor and that we cannot do anything about because the mutations follow our lifespan. And it's said that we conquer 10 cancer tumors during our lifetime if we have a good immunological system. So can biophotonics or biomedical optics have anything to do with this uh, clinical challenges? Can we meet some of these clinical challenges by developing optical photonics techniques? We started quite early, as you see, research in this field, 1982. Uh, Janis, you were born, yeah, you were a young boy at that time. So <laughs> it's a long time ago, now you see this big guy there. So we, we have been doing this during many, many years. And you also see uh, Professor Swamberg here with a lot of- uh, Slightly oh, better. <laughs> nice hair. Anyway, this is the first patient that we treated with uh, some technique, which we call photodynamic therapy. And it's interesting to see that this is a selective treatment modality because this area was illuminated with light all over here. And still you see that there is a selective uh, necrotic formation. I also mentioned that it's very important with early detection. This is a case of breast cancer. If we detect the cancer early, you see that the survival free uh, percentage is almost 100%, while if we discover it late, it goes down dramatically. So this is one 
motivation for why we should be very early with detection. I show this as one example. This is from the neighbor country, Lithuania, where we did a clinical trial together with uh, colleagues there. And we investigated this little area, which is the end part of the uterus. And 95% of all cervical cancers start here. So we invited young, um, mostly young females to come and we had 110 patients coming to our clinical trial. And we could show that with this technique, this is laser induced fluorescence without the fluorescence, only what the tissue itself gives us as the result. And we can see here that for the healthy tissue, we have this high intensity signal while if we have cancer or even early cancer, we see that the signal goes down dramatically and it also has a wavelength shift approximately 60 nanometer towards the red part of the wavelength spectrum. And with a specificity of 91%, we could select also pre-cancer and very early cancer. And at the same time, they were surgically um, uh, treated. So they went from our uh, clinical trial station all the way to the surgery department, which was quite impressive actually, and quite good for the patients. What I show here is a hyperspectral imaging picture where we have, this is exactly this one here. And you see on this side, we can imagine that there is something wrong. And that is also shown brilliantly here in fluorescence. But on the other side, we see exactly the same fluorescence signal, but absolutely not nothing by the naked eye. So this means that it shows really how selective this technique can be. So we can visualize non by the naked eye visible cancer. And that is of course quite promising. Another example uh, of multicolor fluorescence imaging, uh, a skin tumor here, and we have the good overlap here with the fluorescence signal. But you see this little thing there doesn't show up. And the reason for that is that this is only a benign black or brown spot. So this again shows how uh, selective this can be. I will turn over to photodynamic therapy. And uh, that is an interesting aspect of utilizing light, the tissue oxygen itself, and a sensitizing agent. These three together causes tumor destruction if it's used in an optimal way. And the physics behind here is that you have the a molecule, in this case, protoporphyrin 9, it could be many of these sensitizing agents. You shine light onto the tissue, which is sensitized by this uh, molecule. And by excitation, it goes up to a higher energy level, but nothing in nature would like to stay at a higher energy level. So it falls down. And the excess energy that this molecule has gained here is given over to the triplet state oxygen, which in turn is excited to singlet state oxygen, which is extremely high cytotoxic agent. So this is really physics that works in biology. And you have the characteristics here. I already showed the selectivity. It can be repeated as it has no accumulative toxicity. It has a fast healing and minimal scarring. So this is quite, quite um, a promising technique actually. And it can be used both for um, treatment but it can also be used, as I said, for detecting tumors. So the principles you have here, and I show some of the development of lasers here from the very complicated system that we used at physics department. Then we got another laser, which was the next step. It's a, a neodymium jug laser, frequency doubled, as you see the green light coming out here, pumping the dye laser on top. So that was a complicated system, but worked well. And then we had a diode laser, which was the next step. And there is an LED, which can be used for superficial illumination. And one of the first uh, patients here 
a tumor sitting on the back of a patient and you see how nicely it healed. And we have done clinical trials uh, up to phase three trials when we have uh, compared with conventional techniques. And now it's a conventional technique. It, it's actually one of the conventional techniques at dermatology departments in many places. So approximately 3,000 patients were treated uh, together with a colleague at the oncology and dermatology department at Lund University. And we could find that we had a 90% complete response, which is quite good. And we also, of course, developed the diagnostics in conjunction with this. But of course, there is always two sides of a coin and soon a touch upon this. There you see, by the way, that we illuminated the whole area and still we got only necrotic formation in the, in the area which was uh, sensitized. Uh, the, so how can we use this technique for tumors embedded in the tissue? Because what I now discussed was the superficial perpendicular illumination on top of the skin, for example, but we know that the light penetration decreases dramatically when it goes through tissue, only a few millimeters. And one way of overcoming this is to put fibers into the tissue. And actually, the first clinical uh, trial that we did was together with Oncology Center in Riga. And that is together with doctors here and Janis Bigulis, who were the ones from Riga, and we brought all the equipment and, and the, the team here. So this is one of the first patients here in Riga being treated. And this is how we developed this. This is a typical sensitizer. Uh, chemically, they look very similar to hemoglobin but it's empty in the middle here. You see no metal is there for, for hemoglobin. For example, we have an iron there. For chlorophyll, you have a magnesium. Yes. So, so this is very similar to both chlorophyll, hem, but it's a sensitizing agent that we use. And here you see uh, how we would like to utilize this building up the threshold dose treating internal tumors. And of course, we do that by using the fibers. And one niche which is extremely interesting is recurrent prostate cancer. Prostate cancer, as you see, is extremely, extremely common in men. It, uh, it, these two are the ones that have the highest number, lung and prostate. Lung has been the highest number, but it's now so overrided uh, by, by prostate. So prostate is the glandular tissue that is located below the urinary bladder, and it has a lot of uh, organs at risk. There is a sphincter up here. There is a sphincter down here which makes a man continent. No urine can come out when the swingters work. We have the, we have the rectal wall here, which is close to the, to the prostate glandular tissue. So it's an organ inside the body. It's an organ that is surrounded by organs at risk. And this was the niche that we have been choosing for developing this technique further. And uh, what does this mean, that, that we have an interactive interstitial instrumentation here with a worldwide patent? This system has, of course, fibers for the light transmission because light is needed, but it also has the potential of monitoring the fluorescence, the sensitizing uh, agent inside the tissue and also the tissue oxygen. And as you remember, these are the three compounds that are needed for efficacy. And utilizing this uh, readouts here, we can have an online feedback uh, dosimetry, which is of course very important. This is by the way, the back on an envelope uh, sketches that Suna did when he got the idea 
of this. And this is how it works, talking about the organs at risk. You have the rectal wall, the urethra, and the sphincters that I talked about. And this is how the light is built up all the way until we reach the threshold dose. And this is a clinical situation where the doctor first maps out the volume by using ultrasound, then through the matrix here, puts the fibers. And here you see all fibers shining light into the tissue. And you can follow by the, the white spots here where the fibers are located. And since 2017, we are, or this, this uh, company here, is uh, pursuing a clinical trial at these centers here, uh, Canada, London, uh, United States, and also uh, since a few weeks, also the local hospital in Sweden. And this is a clinical situation from one of the surgical theaters. And here you see only how we map out the, the tumor to be treated, how we look at the urethra and the, the urinary bladder, of course, and the rectum, how we can sort of take into account for the dosimetry calculation. And this is again a, a clinical picture where you see all the fibers shining. And as I said, prostate is in the middle of the body, just below the, the urinary bladder. And with the matrix, the fibers are inserted in place here. And you can see the different colors representing the, the wavelengths here with the red light and the, 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 uh, the light, which is also monitoring the, the, the different parameters, as I said. We can do it the, in two different strategies, either the whole uh, prostate, or we can do it only as a focal therapy with only the tumor as a target. And this is, again, a sketch where we can see that all the organs at risk are taken into account as well as 100% threshold dose for the prostate. I mentioned that the antibiotic resistance is a threat equally bad as the global warming. And I will really stress that because infectious diseases that happens to approximately 25% of us will die from that. So it's a big sector of medicine, of course. And the problem is exactly this, that we have developed, not we, but, but the use of antibiotics has been uh, so, uh, I mean, the, the overuse of antibiotics has caused this antibiotic resistance globally. This is the world situation. Of course, many countries here don't have statistics. So that's the reason why we see this. And you can see here that up to 50% of population in different countries here are carrier of multi-resistant bacteria. If you look at Europe, you can see this and you can identify your own country here. So it's quite impressive, the numbers. Only Northern part of Europe is with less numbers of resistance. So bacteria have antibiotic resistance when specific antibiotics lose their capacity to kill the, the infection. So that's the definition. And as we know, Alexander Fleming was the one who um, discovered penicillin uh, 2028, as it's written here. He got the Nobel Prize called Nobel Prize. It's not the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. I hear that all the time. Nobel is a, a class of people, but Nobel is the name of, of uh, Alfred Nobel, okay? So he got the Nobel Prize and, and uh, he said in his lecture, it's not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin. So he foresaw this mm -hmm. e even when it was just discovered. And uh, this is why it's inefficient. The bacteria themselves develop uh, an enzyme, beta-lactamase, that breaks this ring 
and makes the antibiotic inefficient. So it's a bacteria themselves who kills off the, the, the antibiotic. World Health Organization alludes to the fact that we are in a danger that we return to the pre-antibiotic era. And they take the case of tuberculosis, first line, second line antibiotics, they are not efficient anymore. So in a few years, there might not be any antibiotics, no treatment <laughs> options. And you can yourself read about this global risk. One reason is that there are not so many antibiotics developed anymore. The, the trend is, or the, the, the highlight was during these years when many of them were developed. I took this uh, picture in, uh, in Guangzhou at Sujiang River, and I could walk into this pharmacy and buy any of these antibiotics, not because I'm a doctor, but because I am a customer. And, and that has changed a little bit in China, but not so much that it covers a, a sort of a, a wall towards the antibiotic resistance development. Soon I touch upon this and I will finish off my talk by explaining a little bit about applications of this technique, which also was developed. And I think that Janis is on the first paper that was in Lund when you were there, when, when Gosmos was, uh, was developed by Sune. And we have used this for some, um, some indications. One of the important indications is sinusitis. Sinusitis is when you have a cold, afterwards you get pain in the face or in the head. And when you bend down, you say, oh, I have so much pain. And you go to the doctor and you say, I need penicillin. You should not use that for organs because the only thing that is needed is that you open up the channels in between the, the, the sinuses and the openings. The openings are in the mouth, in the nose, or for children in the ears. So the, we, don't have, we don't have any good diagnostic tools available. And we know that it's an obstruction and a blockage, and it's a very common disease. We know that 90% of the sinusitis should not be treated with antibiotics, as still they are. So we did a clinical trial, included 40 patients, used this system, which is, you showed this system, I think, yes, with two lasers, one laser for oxygen and one laser for water vapor. And the reason why we use this too is that we, uh, we utilize water vapor to normalize our signal because we can, in the Ardenbach uh, relation, we can read off the concentration of water vapor if you know the temperature. So that's the reason why- I why there is a change. I would just like to say the two girls there, each of them is the boss of spin-off companies, quite successful in learning, talking about it women in optics and sort of. And the guy there is a big guy in China these days. He was a student of Suna and, and he is now the director of a big company in China. So they are spread out, these students. So here we have a good example on how we can utilize this for looking, as I said, at the channels. And, and in this case, we have a very nice volunteer here and we have a very nice uh, investigator here. And what they did is that they let this person breathe through the nose and then uh, sprayed nitrogen into his nostrils here. And, and what we can see is that we have a high intensity of oxygen concentration. And when we spray this nitrogen, we see that it goes down and then we stop the nitrogen spraying and we see that the oxygen is built up like in the capacitor, which means that his channels are open and he should not need any antibiotics. And that is one of these um, interesting um, results that we got. And we can also see here that even if the, the Sinuses are different in size, as we can see here. When we normalize, we have exactly the same concentration 
of oxygen in the sinuses. These are the results from the clinical trial of 40 patients when we compared our light um, induced uh, gas mask technique here with the computer tomography uh, scans. And of course, you can understand that the patients would really prefer to have light instead of ionizing radiation right into the face where the brain is located. What is interesting to see is that the CT results and our results compare completely with each other. When, when we found that they had some problem, it was exactly the same for the CT results. So that was encouraging, of course. And here you see the statistics. This is uh, the oxygen concentration. This is a size. And of course, if the, it should follow the, the li linearity here. And if we look here, for example, we have outflyers here. They are not outflyers. They are real big sinuses with low oxygen concentration, which means that they are filled with something. And the trick is to find whether they are filled with oxygen, because then we can say they are more healthy. If they are not filled with oxygen, they might pose bacteria, which should be treated with antibiotics. So, so this is a one way of, of calculating this. Uh, together uh, with the Chinese students, we investigated the stability of the technique. And you see that also over the day or over a week, we had quite good stability. So we could make up a baseline for each patient. Here we see what I said, which is important to see if the channels are open. Because if the channels are open, the sinuses will empty themselves. But if they are closed, of course, there is an inclusion inside the, the, the volume and that can cause problems. So here we have a quite healthy patient and we see exactly the same as I explained for the volunteer before, <clears throat> that we flush the nitrogen and then stop the nitrogen and the, the oxygen is built up, uh, resting period of 20 minutes. Then we spray the decongestant because that is one medication that should be used for sinusitis to help the channels to open up. And what we see here is that there is nothing to, that happened because the patient was healthy. If we repeat this with a patient who had a cold, we can easily see that here we have some result that the channel can be opened only by decongestant spray and no antibiotics. So this is, and according to the protocol for us doctors, we should not use antibiotics. And still, of course, we do because the patients may claim that, that they should have antibiotics. We have done exactly the same for middle ear infection in children. And the reason why they get this infection is that the channel in between the ear and the nose here is horizontal, as you see. For audals, it has, has an angle, which means that an audal never get or very seldom get middle ear infection. And they come to the doctor, they have pain, they are crying. And what can the doctor say? Yeah, not so easy. First of all, he or she looks at the red color of the tympathic membrane. And what reflectance spectroscopy can say is how red is the membrane. And that is not, of course, easy to say by only looking. So that's one way, but we can also combine that with the GASMA system and see whether there is oxygen or not behind the membrane. And by combining these two spectroscopic techniques and build that into something which could be a jointly fixed to the otoscope. That might be a good guidance for the doctor to say to the patient or the ma mother that antibiotics should be used or not. And these are the first use of this with one of our students. I will finish off with my last um, application here, and that is the monitoring of lung function 
in small kids. And this is a true, again, cross-disciplinary uh, collaboration in between atomic physics, anesthesiology, and pediatrics. And these are the preterm babies, born before week 37, eight or 10% of all pregnancies in the US and in the Western world, uh, end up with preterm babies with not fully developed organs, and in particular, the lungs which are not covered with the surfactant, so the alveoli collapse, and the brain is, of course, at risk. So they develop the respiratory distress syndrome, which is very de devastating for, for the kids when they grow up. And what the doctors do, they have a conventional uh, surveillance of the babies with X-ray-based investigations. Imagine these small kids or babies, 600 gram, they are exposed to ionizing radiation, which is very, very dangerous and shown that they sooner in life um, develop malignancies. And they also do the blood sampling, which is only a global measure. So there is a need for non-invasive, non-ionizing COTSIDE diagnostics. And this again shows exactly what is the problem. That's a surfactant that is lacking for the small alveoli. And we used the system exactly the same as for the sinuses with the two lasers, with the, the fiber tip on the, on the body here, on the skin and the detector, and looked at the light that penetrates the lungs and can tell us about the saturation uh, of, of the oxygen inside the lungs. And these are the first um, clinical um, measurements that we did. And you see good examples there of the first and second derivative signal. And this is from one of the publications where we really found that this was as a proof of principle possible. And later, uh, spin-off companies have come, and this is one of the, the companies that use exactly the same technique, the gas mass technique for monitoring food, and this has to do with food safety, of course, because if food is old and has, uh, has and oxygen has entered, then the food, the meat, for example, is destroyed. This is a company that has uh, the idea of developing exactly this technique, and this is an offspring company from the first one that I showed, and it's for in situ lung monitoring for 24 hour surveillance rather than doing the X-ray investigation and an alarm system for lung complications. And the third company deals with prostate, um, recurrent prostate cancer, the spectra cure, and the founders you can see here, Stefan Andersson Engels, and the two invited speakers that you have here. This picture only is for the students. I would encourage all students in optics and photonics to apply for the Winter College in uh, Trieste, the ICTP UNESCO School, which is a brilliant idea for young people to learn more optics and photonics. Worldwide uh, teachers are there every year. And uh, as you can see, this is an extremely good place for networking all over the world. So with this, thank you so much. We are running out of time, no time for questions, Seiko. 